Great. Yeah. So we are good to get started. So yeah, we talked about how God ministered to uh, Saul and how he sent him uh, Ananias and the believers in Damascus were so welcoming. They were so encouraging that the initial days of Saul as a believer were spent there. Now, what does he do immediately after that? So uh, Luke writes that he started preaching. Okay. Preaching Christ. Imagine, like, we don't know when he, when Luke says immediately, uh, was that days, weeks, months that he's referring to? The exact timing, we don't know. But like immediately means people still have the memory of Saul as a persecutor. And during that period, how would you like it if, you know, somebody today, you look at that person as a persecutor, very dangerous persecutor, and then you're hearing them preaching a sermon in front of your eyes. Obviously, we will not believe it, isn't it? But that's what's happening. You have the persecutor immediately, it says, preached Christ in the synagogues. So one thing we have to understand about synagogues is they would allow any learned, knowledgeable person to come and speak on any topic. So they allowed Saul to go and preach. But little did they know that he is going to preach about Christ among them. The same person who was against Christ is preaching Christ. Okay, that is amazing. That is amazing. And what is he preaching about the Messiah? He's saying that Jesus is the Son of God. If you recall, in the book of John, we are reading about the titles, right? Son of Man, Son of God. So for the Jews, Son of God is a, again a very clear cut way of pointing to Jesus as deity, okay, as, as a, uh, the, the begotten of the Father. Uh, so the Jews had counted that as blasphemy in the life of Jesus. But here is Saul saying that Jesus is the Son of God. So everybody who heard uh, Saul speaking about Jesus, they were amazed. And they asked, they said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? So they couldn't believe it. Okay, that an opposer is now a supporter. But, Paul, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So what an amazing, amazing thing that has taken place in two chapters here. Seven, chapter seven. Stephen is doing this. Stephen, a man full of wisdom. He is arguing, remember? He is uh, debating, convincing people from other synagogues. One synagogue that was a part of, uh, you know, uh, the people that Stephen took over is Sicilia. We know that Saul was from there. <coughs> now, Saul is doing that. I'm sure God filled him also with wisdom. So with that wisdom, he is, it says, confounded the Jews, meaning argued in such a way that the Jews have nothing to say. And he is proving that Jesus is the Christ. So, <laughs> excuse me. This would have been marvelous in the sight of uh, everyone. So, when this is happening, uh, like initially, maybe the Jews didn't believe that Saul has become a uh, part of the way. But as they kept observing Saul, they must have understood oh, this man. Something has changed. A real transformation has taken place in his life. So the Jews, they were against the apostles. Okay, they were against the believers. So now, once they recognize that Saul is part of them, they become against Saul. They were so angry with him that we read in verse 23 that they plotted to kill him. Okay, so... What a, what a change 
uh, uh, has taken place. He's moved from the team that was persecuting to becoming one who, uh, becoming a part of the team that is being persecuted. So now the Jews are plotting to kill him. But obviously, you know, Saul still had connections. Maybe there were some loyal people uh, whom he knew uh, among the authorities and you know, among the Jewish circle. So we are told that he came to know that they want to kill him. So he was aware and people are just waiting. It says they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Meaning if this man is going to go out of Damascus, he has to go this way. When he comes over here, that's it. You know, we are going to get rid of him. So that was in their hearts. Uh, and, and, you know, Saul knew that. However, the disciples who were with him in Damascus, they came up with an idea and they thought, okay, to protect Saul, how about, you know, we make him escape. If he goes to the gates, the Jews will kill him. So let's figure out a method by which we can get him out of the city of Damascus. So what they do in the night, they uh, let him out through the wall in a large basket. Okay. So uh, this, this is an unusual way of doing things. A large basket, obviously, we can understand here that it was a basket large enough to carry a human being. So quietly they made Saul escape. Okay. So from this, you realize that, see, the church is not going looking for persecution. Even Saul, he could have gone to the gates. He could have fought with the Jews again. But he didn't want to do that. So escaping in this scenario is a lot better. So he just escapes the scene. When persecution comes, face it, but don't go looking for persecution. Saul escapes persecution, opposition, <clears throat> and he's helped by the believers in Damascus. Maybe they only would have given him the wisdom and said, Saul, why do you want to argue with these Jews? You better go out from here and you see how the Lord leads you. So he is let go. What happens to Saul after this, you know? Uh, we we understand that, okay, uh, I, I need to explain one part which I have missed. Here, in verse 23, it says, now after many days were passed. Okay? So this is explained by uh, Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 to 18, where we read that uh, when he was ministering in Damascus, he was not very well received. So uh, for three years, he fled to Arabia. So he fled and he was there for a while. So Damascus, Arabia, you know, that's kind of the region where Saul was for about three years. And then later on, you know, you also study that um, uh, he, he spent, you don't read much about him. You don't read much about him from now till um, you come to Acts chapter 13. Okay. So from Arabia and Damascus, what are the places that Saul went to? What is the kind of ministry that Saul did? You don't have a lot of information about that. So people generally say some uh, uh, 17, 12 plus, yeah, something like 16, 17 years, uh, Saul was quietly ministering wherever the Lord led him. So you don't read too much about his public ministry. So at this point in the book of Acts, we only see him escaping right from Damascus. And then there is what is called as the silent years of Paul unfolding. Okay, So we don't read too much about him, but we know that you know God strengthened him. God, he must have learned uh, a lot uh, about about God and about ministry, received all the revelation which he needed to continue the work in a strong way uh, from Acts chapter 
13. Okay, so between now, we are at in Acts chapter 9, between now and uh, uh, Acts chapter uh, 13, you would have something like 12 years, 12 years or 13 years that go by, uh, and only later uh, you have the missionary journeys of Paul. Okay, so in this chapter so far about the life of Saul, what have we seen? We have seen that he came zealously to persecute the believers in Damascus, but he encountered the Lord Jesus on the path and he had a genuine life transformation, a heart change, and God ministered to him through Ananias. He was blind, but Ananias came and ministered healing uh, and also baptized him, right? He was baptized in water uh, and then immediately he started doing the work of the ministry but he was not accepted he was not accepted by the people uh, and and so and also the jews started uh, hating him so to protect saul the believers make him escape from damascus a little more a little more about saul we'll see and then you know peter comes into the picture hmm. okay verse 26 and when saul had come to jerusalem so from damascus from Damascus, where does he go? He goes to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples there. So, yeah, this seems like a good idea because, uh, you know, if you go to the, if you want to call Jerusalem the head office, you know, you have all the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Saul must have thought, let me go to the main place. Let me go back to Jerusalem. At least there, I will have protection. I will have the wisdom of the apostles. So he goes there. Similar to what the other believers, even Ananias had that doubt. I have heard about this man. He's a persecutor. All the disciples in Jerusalem also were very scared of Saul. So we see <clears throat> they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So they found it hard to accept Saul into their circle or their community of faith. Now, we can imagine Saul would have been so disappointed thinking that I thought these main people will at least understand and be excited about what God has done in my life. But the believers in Jerusalem they were cautious and they said, okay, we can't believe this man. What if he is pretending and what if he gets us in trouble? You know, he'll come to know all our secrets. This must be a plot of the authorities. So they never believed him. But it says there was a man called Barnabas. Now, if you remember, Barnabas is from that, uh, uh, that Levite background. He's a generous man. He's a good man. Okay, uh, uh, we've, we've seen that description of Barnabas. Now you see the attitude of Barnabas here. Barnabas took him. So he seems to be uh, one with a personality of accommodating other human beings. Okay, there are some people like this who, who um, trust faster than the others. So Barnabas is one such person who looks at Saul and he understands, come on. At this stage, we should not leave this man. He has had a genuine heart transformation. So Barnabas takes Saul, brings him to the apostles, and he declares to them that this man has seen the Lord too. He's seen the Lord on the road to Damascus and that he has spoken to him. He also explains to the apostles that this person has been engaging in ministry. Oh, how beautifully, how boldly he preached about Jesus in Damascus. So all this uh, information, Barnabas is sharing it with the apostles to convince them not to be scared of Saul. So because of what Barnabas did, for some time, Saul was able to be with uh, the believers in Jerusalem, coming in and out. And, you know, later you find in his other writings that he talks about how he did not personally spend time with all the apostles except with Peter. 
okay he just spent something like two weeks with peter and that's about it okay uh, so he spent some time with the believers in jerusalem and uh, that yeah so so yeah all right so then th this is it and then he kind of is led from there okay uh, down to caesarea and then back to tarsus so he's sent back to tarsus so we've seen so far in arabia and damascus like about three years and from there i told you we don't know too much about his whereabouts so here we read he goes to tarsus and kind of you know just that is in our minds and then 12 years pass by and then acts chapter 13 happens when he comes back into public ministry but uh, for something for us to see here is how the believing community finds it hard to accept you know, somebody who has lived a life of a persecutor so far okay but an individual like barnabas does the mediation he uh, tries to convince the apostles that now saul indeed is a changed man and they must accept saul okay, so that's how he uh, manages to be with them for some time and then comes to tarsus so that's about the journey of paul uh, and, and now we read that the churches what was happening to the churches now uh, because initially we saw that you know apostles were going and planting churches uh, believers were going and planting churches so what what happened to the persecuted church the region still had persecution okay just because Saul uh, encountered God doesn't mean that persecution stopped. Persecution was still going on uh, in the region. And there were lots of churches also. Okay, at the same time. We see the churches in Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. So in the midst of persecution, what, what can we expect? We, can ex we might expect that uh, people will be discouraged, that people will give up on following Christ. But that is not the case. Instead, the churches had peace, it says, and they were edified or they were strong. So this is how God works. Even today, when we look at some regions in the world and we may think, how can uh, believers be strong in God over here? But sometimes you hear of the the uh, testimony, you know, of, of some of the strongest believers from persecuted regions. I am sure you have heard about some believers, uh, you know, uh, from, I mean, I don't want to take names of uh, places because all this is being recorded, but, you know, you understand, right? Like there are regions in the world where uh, it's not easy to preach the gospel. Uh, there are restrictions. There is threat to life. If you speak the name of Jesus and yet, right, uh, some of the strongest believers, their life stories we hear of uh, from these places. And it amazes us. You see how this verse says, the churches had peace. Peace in the midst of turmoil. Strength in the midst of turmoil. It doesn't mean that they were free. No. But they were strong, even though opposition was there. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So can a church grow when there is persecution? Definitely. The church can receive the work of the Lord. Okay? Uh, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and have that resolve. It says... They walked in the fear of the Lord, meaning they wanted to do what God wanted them to do. So when, when people are living like that, intentionally, what happens? God continues to work in the life of that church and in the life of the believers. And you see that in the midst of persecution, the churches are being multiplied. People are being added. They were, it doesn't say they were added. They were multiplied. So persecution or no persecution, 
God is faithful. Yeah, and the work of God continued in the different regions. So, and that is really beautiful for us to uh, know. And you see how Luke did not forget. Two chapters prior, we were in Samaria. But over there, a lot of miracles happened. You know, wonderful. Peter and John also came and they also did a lot of miracles. And it didn't stop there. We are told that those churches are going strong. So when a work is started, we should not forget that work. But you see the pattern of the early church. They used to think about the work which is started. You don't abandon it. You nurture it. You continue, right? Giving into that work, protect it, make it grow, make sure that it is going well. So that is the attitude of the early church. So that's why Luke is still writing about the church in Judea, church in Samaria, in different regions. Okay, so that's about the churches. Now what about the other apostles? We gave too much attention to um, uh, uh, Saul uh, in this chapter. Now Peter comes back in the scene. The apostles have not stopped doing their work. Peter and John, they went, right? They went to Samaria when they heard that the word of the Lord had gone there. They went, they ministered the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, what are they up to? They are continuing to go to different places to do the ministry. So, you find Peter went through all parts of the country. It says, so busy. is. Uh, if you open his Google calendar, Peter is very busy. He has to go here, there, all over the place. And he's doing that. He's going to various parts of the country that he uh, came now to a place called Lida. Okay, so that was on his calendar. So he went there. When he goes there, he finds a man by the name of uh, Aeneas. Okay, so Aeneas, he is bedridden for eight years and paralyzed. Do you remember anybody similar to this in the ministry of Jesus? Anybody who's paralyzed, bedridden? Yes, okay, yeah, okay, great. So you all are giving me references. Yeah, we do see, we do see uh, paralyzed people whom Jesus healed uh, and, you know, Jesus ministered very miraculously. There was one person near the pool of Beth, uh, uh, Bethsaida whom he said, you know, just, just get up. And then he was able to do that. There was a man that uh, four friends, he brought, they brought him, he was paralyzed and Jesus told him also, like, get up, take up your bed and walk. And he was able to do that. So Jesus was doing this in his ministry. Now, what is Peter going to do when he comes across the same situation? Was this the first paralyzed man that uh, Peter was ministering to? We don't know. Okay, But earlier we saw lame man. He ministered that miracle to the lame man. So when he sees Aeneas bedridden for eight years, Peter does what Jesus did. He says, take up your bed. Aeneas, he says, Jesus Christ heals you. So you see, uh, Peter is very careful to give glory to Jesus. When the lame man in Acts 3 was healed, he said, right? He said that uh, the power in the name of Jesus has healed this man. Why are you looking at us as if we have done anything great? But the power in the name of Jesus has given this man strength. And now, Peter is saying, and yes, Jesus Christ heals you. And the way Jesus said, okay, get up, take up your bed and walk. Similar way. You know, sometimes you just follow the teacher. If you've seen the teacher do that, you also do the same thing. So he says, arise, make your bed. He tells Aeneas. The miracle happened immediately. You read? This person arose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So... Peter ministered uh, a supernatural healing. What are supernatural he healings, miracles supposed to do? They turn the hearts of the people towards God. You remember in Acts 3 when the lame man got healed? It was like the crowd gathered. And then Peter began to preach. 
about Jesus. You know how we did this? This is how. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Now a miracle is taking place in Lydda. What happens? People, their hearts are open. So that is why uh, miracles are very important. Healings are very important. One is they bless the life of the person who is experiencing them. And that person comes to know that God truly loves them. But at the same time, uh, when healings take place, it draws other people to God. Okay, So uh, we should really pray for healings. We should pray for God to do more and more right? healings in our churches today. Then that will uh, show the power of God and people will, will not be able to deny that truly. He's, he's a living God. So in the ministry of Peter, you observe that. He went, he ministered a miracle, and then that became an opportunity for others to come and accept Christ. What else happens? Okay. Now, in a close by place called Jopa, uh, there was a believer by the name of Tabitha. Uh, and you know this this was translated as docus her name okay docus uh, basically a uh, wait both the names mean dear so just a name uh, which was given to this lady but about this lady she was a good lady okay she was so good that uh, it is said that she was full of good works and charitable deeds so uh, somebody who was a blessing in the community Unfortunately, she became sick and she died. So when they uh, had kind of, you know, she died and they, they had to follow the rituals, they heard that Peter had come close by. So they invite him. They ask him to come and minister to this lady because, see, the early church, they really um, believed in miracles. Okay, They believed in uh, God's power and supernatural demonstration of God's power. So when this death happens, you know, they invite Peter uh, and uh, they tell him, like, please come without any delay. Come quickly, in other words, to this place. So Peter, he gets up and he goes. So you just think about the ministry calendar of Peter. I mean, if it was us, Right? Do we do we really uh, believe in the resurrection power of uh, Christ? Do we re really believe in the power of the Holy Spirit? That you know, every place we go, there are healings taking place. And uh, if somebody calls up and says, "Okay, today you have come to this city. Amazing miracles have happened." You know, at the end of the day, what happens? You feel like, "Wow, great! You know, great day of ministry. I preached uh, on the subject, and uh, uh, people also." experienced all these healings a uh, great day let me eat some biryani and sleep right so you you might feel like that but almost immediately a word comes to us and says hey somebody has died you know in the close by uh, uh, area can you come pastor can you come can you pray for that person how would you feel right unless you believed in the supernatural power of god you'd be like oh my goodness i just thought today's work is over i can relax and now they're calling me to raise a dead person. How can I go? Okay, that shows that, you know, we, we still doubt whether God's power can do the work or not. But look at this. You know, Peter, as soon as he got the next assignment, come to Jopa. Dorcas, Tabitha has died. Minister to her. He gets up. He's ready. Okay, next assignment on my uh, calendar now. I have to go to Jopa to pray for Tabitha. So, you find them very active, very passionate, very trusting, believing in the power of God. They just go. They just release the power. They see the work of God being accomplished in every community. So Peter goes. And when he had come, they brought him to that upper room. They had kept her in, in an upper room. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in those times, they had traditions where people will be there crying around the dead person. So there were some widows. Uh, and their job was to cry loudly. And uh, it seems she was good with garments, you know, uh, preparing garments. So uh, the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made, they had kept over there. 
and basically they were mourning they were thinking about her life oh such a good lady she has done such great works and all and they were just mourning over there but peter he puts them out he says okay everyone who's crying can you please go out and he knelt down and he prayed over there and turning to the body he commanded he said tabitha arise and she opened her eyes and when she saw peter she sat up okay uh, and then yeah he gave her his hand lifted her up it says uh, and when he had called the saints and widows he presented her alive wow okay what what a fulfilling way of completing your assignment right so god had orchestrated peter's steps so he was being led by the holy spirit to go to different places and minister to the people that god had put on his heart and he was seeing the results in the work that god was calling him to do now just recently anias eight years paralyzed walking now dorcas tabitha dead she is alive presented her alive and here also it became known throughout all jopa and many believed on the lord so you notice how the minist the apostles the believers they would go not just not just preaching but also doing the supernatural works of god and that brought many people into the kingdom okay so same thing today like jesus like peter we can also preach heal demonstrate the powers of uh, the power of god and that will bring many souls to the kingdom of god so after that it says that peter he stayed many days in jopa so he continued to stay in that same place with a man called simon a tanner a tanner is uh, you know somebody who deals with the the dead animals their skin to make leather so uh, it was not you know it it was not a very well respected job so it seems like peter was staying with uh, a person who's you know uh, like sort of low in the society but he was okay to stay with this person uh, probably because he was also a brother or a believer in the lord so these are his activities in uh, lida and jopa so we can move on to the next chapter here okay uh and uh, one more thought that i want to add about peter is you know peter mm, he is he is a very devoted jew uh, and he was a very proud jew okay uh, but you notice that as he is walking with the lord the the kind of people that he is ministering to he is becoming more and more open so he went to minister in samaria samaria is like a mixed breed a jews and a foreign uh, you know uh, like background it, it's mixed and those people were also not considered very highly but peter is kind of softening up to minister to those who are not pure jews and now he's staying with simon the tanner it's a kind of a low job but peter is not worried about you know oh you should be a rich jew only then i will come and live with you no there is no such issues the humility of his heart uh, he is able to understand that the gospel is for everyone and you know uh, it's it's okay even if somebody is not rich but if he is a brother in the lord yes and god tells me to stay with this individual i will stay so uh, you know that preparedness to be anywhere be ready to stay in any condition for the sake of the gospel but that that heart of humility we are able to see in the apostles okay so yeah i let me just stop here a little bit before uh, i start off uh, on peter's ministry uh, any anything you want to add anything that uh, is ministering to you
Okay, so you're all still digesting what you're hearing. That's my assumption. Okay, and anything, um, maybe if someone can also unmute and share, it'll be nice to hear a different voice. Okay, Arun, sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, what are your thoughts? Anything that uh, you are specifically thinking about? Uh, yeah, yeah, Pastor. Uh, one thing I... Hello? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Arun. You can hear me, Pastor? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, one thing I learned about uh, in the life of uh, the bitter and all these things is that uh, uh, science and wonder, is it really a matter in the ministry? Is it really? Is, is it really? Hello? Ah, yes, yes, Aren. Uh, we didn't get the last part. You said signs and wonders. Is it really? Yeah, is it really matter in uh, ministry? Right. Is it really needed? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, Aren, um, uh, I, I don't know if you made it. You, it's a statement that you said or a question, but I'll anyway answer it. Uh, we... How did people come to know Christ? We've seen even in Samaria, even in Jerusalem, now Midda, Jopa, there is a lot of supernatural healing, miracles, uh, you know, signs, wonders. And that's how the church is growing in all the regions. So today, if we are going to do ministry without the supernatural power of God, uh, it is not aligned to the way the early church did it, no. So it's important. That's the point. It is important. Yeah, Pastor, but uh, some of the believers out here, they are usually they are scared of those uh, signs and wonders, no? So how are we going to handle in that kind of situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I do understand that uh, people can be... Um, very they can be they might be uh, cautious because they have had a poor experience earlier okay uh, but what do we see jesus doing what do we see the apostles doing they they continue the work rm so i feel people can be scared but we should not let that stop us okay you we should continue to minister in this way uh, and we, we will believe that the genuine will uh, diminish the effects of the the falls or the the mm, counterfeit okay example i'll tell you you remember when uh, god called moses moses to bring the people out of egypt he goes to pharaoh and over there in the court, like there are sorcerers, there are black magicians. And uh, Moses, he throws the rod, okay? And he does all these signs where the rod becomes a snake uh, and all. So even the magicians are able to do that. But does Moses stop doing uh, his, his uh, demonstration of the supernatural? No. He also continues. The magicians also continue. But at the end of it, what happens? The snake that is produced by Moses' rod eats up the, all the other snakes. So one lesson we can learn from here is the enemy will also do supernatural things. Okay. But we should not stop. We should keep continuing. God will work in people's hearts. So that's, that's uh, the 
I mean, that's how we go about it. Does does it make sense, Aran? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. So let's just continue. Let's just continue. We should not get uh, worried. What, what will the people say and all that? Um, yeah, so that's about the supernatural. And uh, one more thought I'll add to it. See, Satan, no, he will always try to make a counterfeit of something that is valuable. He won't waste time on something that's not valuable. So when he knows that these signs, wonders, and miracles are valuable, what is he trying to do? He's trying to bring an imitation. Okay? So if there is an imitation, we know that this is valuable. So we should not stop. Yeah, yeah. Very, very good question, Aran. Yeah. Anything else, class? Any anything else that you are thinking about? Mm. Okay. Aran shares about her background. Yeah, where she comes from a certain denomination where they didn't where they did not believe in the supernatural. Yeah. Yeah, Aran. Uh, a lot of denominations don't believe, but again. You know, we have to be Bible-based. It's not about what our denomination believes. It's about what the Bible says. And in the Bible, we see emphasis on the supernatural work of God. Jesus did it. The early church did it. So how is it wrong? Yeah. True. True. Yes. Right. So... Yes, uh, class. A anything else from your side based on what we have looked at? Okay. So, uh, so far we have seen, you know, the change of heart that people are having, the uh, journey of Paul, the beginning of the journey of Paul we have observed. Uh, and And even in the life of Peter, right? God is transforming his heart. I told you he's a Jew. He's uh, very uh, stuck on his own way of doing things. Like in general, that's that's how uh, we have painted a picture of Peter. But slowly things are changing for him. He has ministered in Samaria. He is staying in uh, Joppa, in Simon the Tanner's house. And now what is God going to do in the life of Peter? So we have a little bit of time, maybe two, three minutes, I will just share and then we will pray and wrap up. So Acts chapter 10. In this chapter, God is concerned about a man called Cornelius. So it says there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Wow. You know, when the Bible describes a person, it's so beautiful. And there are good people whom uh, we see, like Barnabas. It says about Barnabas, right, that he was also a giver. He was a generous. He was a good man. It says he was a good man. Then uh, we, who else did we see? Good person. Yes. Okay, fine. Now, uh, we're looking at Cornelius. And Cornelius also, it says... He was a devout man. He feared God. He gave arms. So the Bible is describing, you know, a good life. And, and uh, somebody who's living their life like this, praying, giving, they were actually showing their devotion to God. Okay. Uh, and we will understand that Cornelius is not a Jew. He's not uh, a Jew and yet his heart is devoted to God and he's trying to practice all the things uh, which are necessary to uh, fear God. Okay, in verse 3, and about the ninth hour, he has a vision. Remember, God is speaking. How does God speak? Dreams, promptings, uh, angels. You know, an angel comes and tells the apostles, you go. You know, you go back to the temple, you go preach there. So communication of God. Again, Cornelius, he receives a vision. In a vision, and in the vision, an angel of God. Okay, so that's the way God is speaking to him. What 
what does the angel say name remember saul uh, ananias cornelius so god is speaking to the individual and when he observed him he was afraid and said what is it lord you see people are responding to the communication of god and saying what do you want me to do where do you want me to go lord all of them are responding cornelius is saying what is it lord meaning what do you want me to do then uh, so the angel replies and says your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before god now send men to joppa and send for simon whose surname is peter he is lodging with simon the tanner whose house is by the sea he will tell you what you must do isn't this so beautiful that the holy spirit is directing people to go and meet other people imagine today you know in our churches if this happens if let's say dev has a dream about uh, somebody in his place where he is staying right now he has a dream and says you know brother uh, uh, again brother john he stays in this place he is praying i want you to go there i want you to minister there and then you know uh, let's say siddharth has a dream and god is showing him i want you to go down to this particular area street number 7 go to house number this there is a person there he is a good person he has lived this life so well before me and you know i want to minister to him i i will minister through you if god makes these supernatural connections in our life today you know wouldn't that be amazing but you see that in the early church holy spirit is speaking giving people visions directing them to cross paths with each other so that's really like you know a wonderful very dynamic exciting work of the holy spirit taking place among the people and you see here there is a man he's not even a jew but he was devoted to this god right he was devoted to god and whatever he did in the name of god god recognized it and you see so when we pray when we give for god in the name of god all these things come before god and god always remembers those things so god is saying look there is a man he has done these good things and i remember it and i am going to do something in his life today so god was intentionally god ministered to paul on the road to damascus god ministered to anias when he was paralyzed god ministered to tabitha when she was dead okay and now god is ministering to cornelius because of his good life and that's the way god is ministering to people here in the book of acts so let us just pray right now we will close because time is up and we will pick up from where we have stopped in the next class i will pray heavenly father we thank you lord for your grace lord your mercy lord even as we have had the time to study and learn lord from your word from the book of acts father we pray that the, this word will revive our spirits lord and lord we believe that what you have done lord in the in the book of acts in the lives of the people that lord you can can you will do that in our lives so today father i just speak and declare dreams visions lord communication lord from heaven into each one's life father uh, all the students father god every listener and i just pray lord that you will pour out your spirit on each one of us and lord we pray that lord we will see greater wonders and lord greater things done in our lives lord even greater than what we are seeing uh, today father god in these chapters lord we thank you once again we commit the rest of the time the classes into your hands lead us and guide us lord we bless you in jesus name we pray amen amen so thank you class and uh, i will see you next week in uh, acts god bless have a good day bye for now thank you man thank you man bye thank you bye bye